Hello all of you little demons, Jules here for WhatCulture.com and yes, you've read the title, it's time for another Not List, aka an episode of These Things Suck, a format where I and my neck vein Jeremy take a whistle stop tour around the film industry, find things that just twist our nipples in the wrong way and we make videos about it for your entertainment. And today we are talking about an absolute stinker in the form of superhero films that absolutely suck. Now this is the thing, you think that making a superhero film would be easy like Thanos just snapping his big sausage fingers like boom there is an inbuilt fan base that we've already got there is years of a back catalogue of stories that we can draw from and there are many many high profile actors that would want to be attached to something of this caliber especially when we can spin it off into its own extended universe and just make all the oily money we can rub up and in ourselves you think it'd be easy so I ask you, why do so many of these films absolutely suck? Well, we're here to take a look at some of them today. About the films that aim to take flight, yet just crashed headfirst into a wheelie bin within moments. Some were doomed to fail, some were examples of tragic production issues, but all things are unified under the big banner of the suck. Because these superhero movies totally and utterly suck. <laughs> So the Fantastic Four have had an experience rougher than the thing's gnarled cock when it comes to silver screen adaptations because the first family of comics is just, they've tried time and time again but with little success and been raked over the coals commercially and critically in the process. From changing key elements of the established canon for seemingly no reason, to turning Galactus into a giant space fart, to genuinely rotten behind the scenes stories about directors adding CGI tears in because apparently Jessica Alba was ugly when she cried for real, seriously, that's disgusting. What should have been an easy recipe of superhero family beat bad guys into base elements ended up churning out a deep fried and very snotty tissue of an experience that the bloke behind the counter is definitely claiming as a cheeseburger. It is not, and yet we still were forced to eat it. When looking at the franchise as a whole, it was easy to point fingers at the problems limiting its potential, the terrible villain motivations and portrayals, the often laughable CGI implementation, and of course, the acting which was both scenery chewing and yet utterly starved of depth. It was a woeful cocktail for sure, but for some reason the 2015 reboot of the series looked to add even more problems rather than fix anything. I say this because what worked for the prior two flicks, namely the over-the-top goofiness was completely stripped away from this reboot and instead it was replaced by what I can only assume is what is inside Ben Shapiro's soul, aka nothing. Actually scratch that, the movie does contain one emotion very strongly and that's utter contempt for its source material and by extension its audience. From attaching its clobbering time to Ben's older brother, to government researchers attending a school science fair, to my personal favourite, characters getting annoyed that they can't pilot their mad experiment into space despite not having any formal astronaut training. Like, come on, you are literally not qualified to run this project. Stop acting like an ass. Add to this an overtly depressing tone, grim colour edit, and a villain who literally just decides to be evil on a whim to give us a third act, and we have the makings of a project that tried to ghost the tone of the original but lost all of the playful spirit along the way, thus leaving it utterly dead on arrival at the box office. Now here's the thing, I absolutely loved the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles as a kid, or as they were known here, the Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles, because apparently ninjas and nunchucks were stuff that the UK censors just did not want any part of, even though they allowed guns and big blades in there weird times. I absolutely loved this franchise as a kid, but when it came to the movies, it was less a case of cowabunga and more come on mate, how have you bungled this up? I say this because even though the first two live action adaptations will hold a special place in my heart alongside the Street Fighter movie as so bad that I unironically love them, nearly every other iteration has been so god awful that you'd wish the franchise had just stayed in the sewer. Still, before you think that I'm about to harsh on the more recent turtle-headed droppings that the Michael Bay production team have just squirted out onto the public forum, I am instead going to be talking about a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles film that is so bad that it will make you want to drop a brick on your terrarium. I'm speaking, of course, about the time-travelling tripe fest that is the 1993 TMNT3 movie, which, while being a very fun title to say, is likely the most enjoyment you will ever get out of this experience. Actually, that's not true per say as ripping apart this film is very fun for those masochists out there that put themselves through the rigours of watching it in the first bloody place. For starters, let's talk about the direction. Where the f*** is it? 
Do you think that the turtles going back to feudal Japan would provide some interesting scenarios, but it is so bland and aimless that you could literally replace the turtles with pretty much anything else and it did not affect the plot in the slightest. Plus, the costume design for the turtles themselves is absolutely hideous. Oh, wait, wait, sorry, uh, just uh, just two seconds. Uh, yeah, glad I caught you. Uh, just want to ask a quick question. About to go and make the uh, costumes for the heroes here. Just want to ask, how many sunspots do you want on each of the turtles? Well, uh, well, I mean, none. I mean, why would I want sunspots on them? They're going to look sickly. The kids will just be like, what the hell's wrong with them? Okay, just so I'm clear here, did you say none or f***ing loads? Because uh, they both sound very similar to me. None. Absolutely zero. None. Okay, gotcha. He didn't get you. In fact, the only costume that actually kind of looks on brand here is Splinters, whose I'm so done with this shit appearance is something that we can all relate to. Also, if you're going to have Casey Jones in a movie, please, for the love of God, have him actually kicking ass and not babysitting some time-traveling guards the entire movie. And yet, this is just the tip of a truly terrible film, as you're then forced to wade through dated pop culture references, woeful action set pieces that make slamming action figures together seem balletic, and of course, a laboured music video inclusion designed solely to shift whatever trash fire song this film came bundled with. And finally, and finally, if you thought that in Sonic 06, the video game, the really horrible moment where Sonic is kissed by that princess is something that just turns your stomach, then oh baby, have I got something that will make you violently ill. And that is this scene here where one of the turtles gives CPR to a young boy named Yoshi. You cannot unsee this. And now you have to see it too. Now, when it comes to deciding which of the rather girthy X-Men film franchise members that I'm going to fire my laser-like precision eye right up their hole, it was actually quite a difficult task because even though the franchise has got the likes of Logan and the outstanding X2, there are some utter dirty dogs inside this franchise. I could go on at length about how X-Men Origins Wolverine hobbled the likes of Deadpool for years after, or how we have to basically pour one out for Gambit every time this film comes on, as it will likely be the only iteration we'll ever get to see on the big screen, or I could have just grabbed Apocalypse by his stupid Ivan Ooze face and demanded why he didn't use his amazing mutant powers more because he came across like a goon in his own f***ing movie. However, today we're going to be looking at the rather sad and pathetic case of X-Men Dark Phoenix, which managed to act as both a horrible reimagining of an already botched storyline and as a sour handoff from Fox to Marvel that was the equivalent of giving somebody their toy back but breaking it just before it touches their palm. It's just like foxes, they're like, oops, sorry, dropped it in a pile of shit. And Marvel's just there like, you brought the bag of shit in with you, mate. I saw you bring it in and you just walked over there. It was in the corner of the room. You dragged it over and you just dropped it in there. Why'd you do that? <laughs> whoops, butterfingers. From the jump, there was something absolutely rotten about this project, and when it was announced that extensive reshoots were taking place, the excrement-based writing was basically on the wall. Yet people still turned out in their droves to check out Fox's X-Men swan song. It's just a shame that the song in this case was the screeching sound of metal as the entire roller coaster ride came off the bloody tracks. In fact, the movie itself provides a lovely example of how little shits it gives at this point, when they have that scene where they fly the X-Jet up into space, and everyone has a go at Hank for saying, I'm pretty sure I didn't design this to go into space, and yet apparently it just does, it just goes in space now. It just smacks of a big, who the f*** even cares anymore? How do you take a story that is as complex and iconic as the Dark Phoenix saga and somehow make it utterly boring, linear, to the point of frustration, and add in new elements of the story which lessen the impact of things overall? It's not even like this is new ground either, as the subject was one of the focal points of Last Stand, yet here becomes a fecal point because it was smashed with unnecessary stank. Action scenes were dropped in to pad out an utterly anemic plot, and without going to IMDB, I wouldn't even be able to tell you who the villains of this piece actually were because they were instantly forgettable, and all played to the sound of acting with all the life of a bloody death knell. Now, I don't hate this film as much as Wolverine Origins or Last Stand, but you know what? I am so disappointed in it that somehow that's even worse. Oh, sorry, I've got a phone call here from the uh, very dusty, I haven't used this in a while, Darla Dickhead. Hello, Darla Dickhead here. Oh, 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 
we're talking about Catwoman now, are we? Oh, fantastic. Thank you for ringing in. Um, yeah, I actually did want to talk to you about this because let me just get this straight. You've got a white-hot property in the form of Catwoman. You've got a huge library of her backstories that you could draw from. And you've got the backing of Warner Brothers to the tune of around $100 million. That sounds like the perfect recipe for a decent Catwoman story. So can I just ask you quickly, how many of these elements from the DC lineage are you actually going to be drawing from? Yeah, I thought that you'd say that. Precisely fucking zero. Are you, are you absolutely deluded? Yes, unfortunately, this was indeed the case when it came to 2004's Catwoman, which, while marketing itself as a loose adaptation of the Catwoman character, was actually a pretty apt Swamp Thing film as it was covered in utter dreck. For a start, Selina Kyle is out, and in her place we get... Patience Phillips, who is a timid and meek character who then becomes a sexy dominatrix-esque crime fighter thanks to some magic cats. I wish I was fucking kidding. This film is complete and utter garbage, as alongside some rubbery CGI and a plot that makes little to no sense at times, commits the worst sin possible for a film centered around female empowerment, in that it over-sexualizes Catwoman, lingers on shots of her body, focuses on an evil makeup brand, and shows women of power actively fighting against one another, all the while offering no significant character development whatsoever. And all of this combines to provide a vapid, cynical take on what an executive would think about hot button topics. It is sex appeal covered in sour milk. Thanks. I hate it. Right, in the final straights now. We can do this, Jeremy. We can make it. But unfortunately, ahead of us is our biggest trial ever, because we're about to talk about the son of the mask. Now, I know some of you might not consider the mask to be a superhero, but you do have to admit that he most definitely ticks all the right boxes. Powers beyond that of a normal person? Check. Ridiculous villains hamming it up to charcuterie levels? Check. A loud-ass suit that would immediately draw enough attention for anyone to be able to spot them retreating back to their lairs and instantly find out where they are? Oh, you best believe that's a check. Yet, you know what ticks all the wrong boxes when it comes to things like writing, character development, CGI implementation, and common human de- Decency, the son of the f***ing mask film, which if we're accepting is itself a superhero film of sorts, is easily one of the worst things I've ever seen. So, in order to make sure that you are in the right mindset for this film, what I want you to do is take all of the beloved characters from the original, all of the funny moments, all of the writing perfection, sweep that into a f***ing bin, right? So you've got nothing on the table so far. Then what I want you to do is grab Morph, you know, friendly little Morph here that I'm hoping that Joe has just animated onto the palm of my hand, pop him into a microwave for a bit, it, boil him until he's covered in blisters, because that is now your new standard of CGI, and then just wrap it all up in absolute cynicism, nastiness, absolutely puerile comedy that nobody finds funny because it is actually very cruel. And then take a typewriter and drop it on the back of your head. Now you're ready to see this film. I cannot stress how utterly disgusting the animation in this film is, both being so nightmarishly stretchy and burrowing deep into the uncanny valley at the same time. And it's made all the worse when each and every CGI abomination is forced into the viewer's faces. I don't know if this film was planned to be 3D, but you won't need those glasses what with all the fisheye shots of these green monstrosities forcing their way through the screen. And the tone of the project is equally obnoxious, swinging wildly towards being family-friendly enough to draw kids in to see it, but then scarring them for life with horrible messages about pissing babies, nightmare children, and of course parents who genuinely act like they don't want their own offspring. This film is so needlessly cruel in its attempts to tear apart the family dynamic that a price of admission might as well come with emancipation of minors papers. And it tries to play these mean-spirited moments off as jokes to the point where it feels like watching an episode of Black Mirror in places. This is a hit piece directed against having kids while being directly marketed to them. Harsh. Ooh, and there we go, my friends. Those were these superhero films suck, and I hope that you enjoyed it, because I've shortened my lifespan by a good 10 years doing this, so I hope that you appreciate it. Let me know what you thought about it down in the comment section below, and also suggestions for next time's episode whenever I get around to making it, because I love to read all your feedback, and it's a good laugh from here on out, my friends. But before I go, I just want to say one thing. Not only can you follow me over on Twitter at RetroJ with a Zero, but I also want to make sure 
sure that you're taking care of yourself both mentally and physically because you deserve all of the best things in life, my friend. I know when I do these videos, I ham up the hyperbole of being angry, but I don't carry that forward into my real life and I want you to try and do the same. Let go of anger if you have the capacity to do so and speak to people about your problems because trust me, sharing these problems dissipates that anger, resentment, frustrations, whatever it is that you're being going through at this point in time makes things a lot easier going forward. And that's all I want for you, my friends, to go out there and live a healthy and happy life. Big love to you, my friend, all right? As always, I've been Jules. You have been awesome. Never forget that. I'll speak to you soon. Bye.